Chewy meat for now. Recording in progress. Johan, there's a message for you. Yeah, I think I might have done the privacy thing. So, oh, here we go. So I can do mine now. I'm Good. still unable to do it. I don't know why. I, I managed to unlock it. Right. Uh, people are coming in. We'll probably give it another 30 seconds and then we'll kick off. Just one second. Are you on a Mac, Sanjeev? Yeah, same. Um, when I went to privacy, the, the, and also unlock the padlock at the bottom. Yeah, click here to make changes. Use password. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks. Okay. Right, it's, uh, it's just gone 18.31, so I think we'll start. Uh, a very good evening, uh, ladies and gents, and welcome to the sixth episode of the British Ship Society Midweek Special. I'm Vikas Kanduja, Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon in Cambridge and the Chair of the Education Committee in the British Ship Society, and it's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. Now, our aim with this series is to bring to you clinical cases and discuss nuances in decision-making and management from key opinion leaders in the UK, so that we can continue to fulfill the society's manifesto of sharing knowledge and improving patient care. We've already had an excellent session on FAI the last month, and this is the second in the hip preservation series, and today's session would be focused on dysplasia. Moderating the session today would be Mr. AJ Malvia from Northumbria, with stellar faculty including Johan Witt, Sanjeev Patel, and Mr. Callum McBride from Birmingham. And I'll let AJ introduce all of them to you in a moment. We're also delighted to be collaborating with Auto TV Global for this series and welcome all the viewers from the Asia Pacific region who are able to watch this event streaming live at no cost via Auto TV. Thank you, Ashok. We also strive to make this event as interactive as possible. So therefore, please post in your comments and questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists will address some of these questions as we go along and choose some of them to discuss at the end in the discussion section. For those of you who are not able to join us live, we do have the option of on-demand viewing via our platform called Panopto. Once again, a very warm welcome to all of you and hope you enjoy this webinar and also the series. Over to you, AJ. Many thanks, Yukas. Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on uh, hip uh, dysplasia. My name is AJ Malvia. I'm one of the consultants based in uh, Northumbria Trust. And um, we've got a stellar faculty, as Vikas has already mentioned, from the north to the south uh, of uh, UK, who are extremely experienced in dealing with uh, hip uh, dysplasia. So hopefully you will find this uh, session quite uh, thought-provoking and educative. Try to make it interactive by asking lots of questions. So the aim of uh, this webinar would be to bust certain myths about hip dysplasia. So the first myth is that it's a problem only in babies. In fact, we see it quite routinely in adults and it's uh, a very commonly missed problem. The second myth is that if there is no arthritis, if you can't find anything wrong on the x-rays, then it's all in the head. Now there are very subtle signs that you find in radiology and examination and history, which will point towards a diagnosis of hip dysplasia. And hopefully through the session, you will learn to pick up those uh, signs. And the third myth is that uh, pelvis is a very complex area and it's dangerous to be delving into it. And pelvic osteotomy is a dangerous operation. Again, through the session, I hope you will be able to see that uh, an osteotomy, a pelvic osteotomy can easily be performed safely in a very controlled manner with actually some excellent results. 
So this is going to be the program for the day. We are going to have some uh, talks, 10 minutes each by Mr. Patil and Mr. McBride. And then we'll have four representative cases that we see in day-to-day -day life. And uh, hopefully again, the, the, this will be interactive and you'll find them useful. <clears throat> So first on will be actually Mr. McBride, and he will be talking to you about principles of osteotomy for hip dysplasia. Well, Mr. McBride is a, a contemporary. He, uh, we trained almost uh, around the same time. He works in the Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham. He's done fellowships in uh, Sydney, and he took up the mantle of uh, uh, leading the young adult hip service in uh, Birmingham from uh, John O'Hara. So Callum, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just load up my slides. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, we've just changed the order slightly because of the uh, um, uh, some of the Zoom problems. So I'm going to talk about the principle of osteotomy, and then we'll probably come back to looking at how we um, some of the other factors around patient selection. But um, I'm from Birmingham, and uh, I just want to plug the non arthroplasty hip registry. So if you're doing this kind of work, please contribute. Um, the, the hardest thing, I think, in, in our job is actually choosing the right patients. So um, patient selection is actually key, and we'd all like to have these patients to operate on, nice, slim, female, probably going to do well with whatever intervention we offer them. But um, uh, age for me is a is a cutoff, um, and anybody over the age of fifty, pretty much biologically, then then I wouldn't offer them osteotomy. Now, a lot of our patients are a bit more like this, and uh, and they're a bit more tricky to know how to manage. Um, smoking status is for me an absolute no when it comes to osteotomy, um, and then there's red flags. So um, if the patient's got abnormal illness behaviour, uh, that can be tricky to manage as well. Um, for me, a cutoff of the weight, and, and it, again, it's a, a, a movable feast, as it were, um, is a BMI of greater than 35. We know a number of factors, apart from age, affect outcome, but particularly the extent of arthritis. And for me, once the hip is arthritic on x-ray, that's a, also a definite no. And then it's a debate about how much arthritis is acceptable on an MRI, which I'll come to a little bit. And then also we need to make sure that we've got, uh, if we're going to move the joint around, it's going to be congruent in whichever position we want to put it in. So for me, the essential imaging is an, a plain AP pelvis x-ray. And, you know, I see a number of patients who come with just an MRI, but it, it really is the x-ray that you need to diagnose dysplasia. But then it's a three-dimensional problem. So we need um, a scan of the a CT of their pelvis, their knees, and also the tibia, uh, the ankles, because this is often associated with rotational problems. In Birmingham, we all, all patients will have a 3T uh, uh, non-contrast MRI. Now, the reason for this is not to diagnose their labelled tear, which you can really do clinically. It's basically to um, understand how much uh, degenerative damage is within the hip, uh, because then that enables us to then counsel the patient. And that's the other key to getting good outcomes is patient education. So you really must empower these patients in the decision-making process. Often they, they, if they've ever heard of dysplasia, again, think it's something of babies. But these are adults who've been ignored for years um, and they want to know about their condition. So here's some resources that you can turn to. And I highly recommend this leaflet, which is produced from Stanmore by two physios, one in Manchester, one in Stanmore, who've uh, questioned patients about what they would like to know about hip dysplasia. So it's available from them or from me. This is a brilliant education leaflet for patients. So we think they might need an osteotomy. Well, what osteotomy we do? Well, it's a bit like asking a hip replacement surgeon how to do a hip replacement. Everybody will tell you something different. And these are all good ways of doing the operation, but they all have slightly different names. And every surgeon who does a PO will do it slightly different. And then the same is true of osteotomies of the femur. You know, you can do derotation, you can use a nail, you can use a blade plate, you can use an AO plate. So there are lots of different ways of achieving the same outcome. But the bone of contention is what's the role of hip arthroscopy? And again, you ask a surgeon, they'll give you a different answer. But it, in my practice, um, it's a fairly limited role in dysplasia and it's only done if I'm then going to correct the uh, bony deformity. Um, there are some surgeons who do pelvic osteotomy in which they'll do arthroscopy on every patient. That is not normal practice in the UK. 
But the most important thing is don't do hip arthroscopy in dysplasia if, you, if there is no ability or plan to do a uh, corrective osteotomy surgery. That's a bad idea. So how do we plan these? Well, we start with the x-ray. Most of you will have heard of the uh, center edge of Weiberg, but there is a modification of that, which is uh, the, uh, uh, by Ogata, uh, which is to the edge of the articular surface. Um, and um, what's normal? Well, again, it's it's a spread, isn't it? And no one measurement will tell you whether this patient's got dysplasia. But you should be wary if one of those measurements is less than 25 and think that there could be hip instability or dysplasia here. Now, we also use this, which is the saucer or the acetabular index. In this case, it's about 18 degrees. Now, you can think of that as the correction angle in the coronal plane. When we do these uh, osteotomies, we're going to want to make that horizontal. Um, so that's the way to think about it is the correction. Um, you need to have concern and think that this could be dysplasia if that angle is more than 11. But there are lots of other things like here, like the soft tissues and the mobility of the patient. Now, what about this? This looks like a normal x-ray. But again, we've got a young female with a lot of groin pain. When we look more carefully, we can see that this patient may have a problem with the version of their native socket. And we can look at this more closely on a CT. This is a CT of that young lady. And we can see that when we measure their version, that top one should be at 90 degrees. And when we go further down the socket, we can see that there's either anterior deficiency or increased acetabular anteversion. So we look at the 3D CT and we can see that this patient has got both. She's got an anterior deficiency and increased anterior. <clears throat> now, it's very easy to think this patient would have an X-ray and an MRI and somebody to go in and do a labral repair because they've got a labral tear. The problem with doing that is you haven't dealt or addressed with the bony insufficiency here. And so that lovely repair will then re-tear and the patient will not thank you. So version needs to be looked at, but it can be abnormal in lots of different cases. So it can be abnormal in uh, an underdeveloped socket. It can be abnormal in an overdeveloped socket. So you need to have a global understanding of what you're do, dealing with. Retroversion, again, maybe look at this x-ray and think it's either normal or maybe slightly overcovered. But there are some indicators here. There's the crossover sign of the anterior and posterior wall and a bilateral ischial spine sign, which is suggestive of a versional problem. And when we do a CT, we can get again on the acetabulum, we can see the retroverted. And it's often the case in these patients, they will have a versional or an rotational malalignment lower down. And in this case is in the femur. So how do we correct these? Well, there's the PAO, uh, otherwise known as the Gantz or the Bernese, which is maybe the most popular. And two of the speakers today, uh, or three of the speakers other than me, uh, uh, do this osteotomy. So there's an incomplete ischial osteotomy, uh, which is done through a single incision, a complete pubic osteotomy, and then the ileal osteotomy to meet. That allows you to rotate and correct the deformity in any of the planes that you wish to do so. Um, there is the Birmingham uh, periacetabular interlocking osteotomy, which is what we do in Birmingham. The difference here is that we do do a complete division uh, of the uh, posterior column uh, with the ischial cut. Like the PAO, we do a similar pubic cut, um, but we do a different interlocking cut here, which is an ABC cut, which I'll talk a little bit more about. There's been a modification of this by the Californian group um, and the Colorado group, sorry, the California Colorado and the Southern California group, and uh, that's where they do this cut, which goes down the posterior column, retaining it. So I'll just talk about the BIPO because that's what I do. Um, it's a two incision approach, initially starting in the lateral position with a small buttock incision. You find the sciatic nerve, retract it so you know you're away from it and it's uh, protected. You cut the ischium, the SN here is the sciatic nerve, and you um, uh, can see uh, the nerves protected and cut the ischium completely. We turn the patient without redraping, do an ilioinguinal approach, cut the pubis, and it's this one I want to draw your attention to. So if you look at the ABC cuts, they've marked those out, but the important thing is the yellow line here. And if we look at the x-ray in the bottom right, that yellow line is the same angle as the saucer angle, that uh, correction angle. And we put two pins in, one and two, um, which are um, chance pins that are going to allow us to move the fragment. 
So we do those cuts and the cuts are made at the same angle. So the angle between B and C is the same as the correction angle. And that allows us to free up that central acetabular fragment to rotate it. So just to explain that, this is a diagram, the pins one and two at the angle of the, the source tool that we want to correct. We do the cuts, we rotate the fragment, reduce it and fix it in place. And you can see that the yellow line is now horizontal. Now, if we want to deal with versional problems, we can do that simply by rotating internally or externally that fragment as necessary. Here's one I did a few years ago, uh, probably, you know, maybe about seven or eight years ago. And uh, you can see she's dysplastic. She's got an upsloping sorcel and we corrected her and I've subsequently done her other side. But we mustn't again forget the femur. Now, depending on uh, where you hold your foot and depending on your femoral version and your tibial torsion, you will have either a normal foot progression angle or internally or external, but you may find an abnormality on examination, either in the prone or the supine. So it should always be looked at. Now, this is a very complicated slide from the Swiss group, Morris Tanitz and his group. But what it shows really is that in the patient group that's presenting with groin pain to their clinic, there is a whole array of abnormalities. And so you must look for these and measure them. So I'll just draw you to this group. This is like that group of the patient with the retroversion. They've got acetabular and femoral retrotorsion. You can argue, again, what's normal in these groups. But the important thing here is to look for it and then decide as to whether it needs correcting. Now, how do these patients do? Well, they do really well. And there's a, a, lots and lots of papers, many from the authors uh, of the authors who, who are at this meeting in multiple centers with different techniques and all demonstrate that these osteotomies are effective. Roughly 85% will see significant improvement in their PROM scores by 12 months. And the other benefit, apart from improving their quality of life, is that they then don't need a hip replacement for at least 20 years, if not more. But that's dependent on their things like the amount of degenerative change, their age, etc. It is a big operation, but the patients recover extremely well. And most, lots of people really worry about this operation being a risky operation. It isn't. It really isn't, in, at least in our hands, any more risky than having a total hip replacement. <laughs> Somehow I can still do everything so, I did before. Uh, um, so this is a video here on the bottom right, not of one of my patients, and uh, but, but of one of the surgeons in Southern California. And you can see how incredible her outcome. But this is what we can expect after many of these patients who have this operation. But you need to understand who's going to do well and who's not going to do well with surgery. Beware the normal x-ray make sure you understand and assess the three-dimensional anatomy and use a technique that suits you and suits your patients and allows you to get that anatomical. Thanks very much. Excellent, Callum. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, everyone, please keep the questions coming via the chat function. Uh, we will uh, pass it on to the faculty uh, once, uh, obviously, all the talks are finished. So the next talk is going to be by Mr. Patil, who is uh, a consultant based in the QE Hospital in Glasgow. He's extremely experienced in dealing with dysplasia and young adult hip problems. He's done fellowships in Vancouver and San Diego and so many other places. He's got many accolades, but he doesn't want me to share them with you. He just wants me to introduce uh, him as the friend. So, Mr. Patil, my friend. Sanjeev, uh, could, could you kindly unmute yourself? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thanks, CJ, and thanks, everyone, for the kind in mind. So, I'm going to talk about which, who, I mean, we already heard how do we manage these patients. Who are these patients we are talking about? Let's, let's have a look at it. Uh, so 25 year old lady comes with a right groin pain for last six months. She has pain at the end of the day. She's able to still carry on with her normal life. Examination, we examine them, good range of movement, negative, slightly irritable hip, maybe positive impingement test. That kind of a patient we are looking at here, not much. And what do you do? You, you could either dismiss it or you could do an x-ray. You do an x-ray, it shows something like this. 
I'll show you. Before I did the fellowship, I used to think this is a normal X-ray, but let's look at the inset. Already you, you can see the inset is a normal X-ray, and here you can see the slope is different. It is not horizontal, and the lot of, lot of the head is not covered. So we are looking at this kind of patients. So what do we do? We could ignore it. We could do something. Why intervene? We want to do it to improve the congruency or coverage or biomechanics. Yes, in a way, but mainly for the pain relief. Patient is coming to you for the pain relief. So we need to identify these patients and do something about it. If we don't do anything, what happens? We've got studies showing up to 50% of the patients below 50 years of age getting osteoarthritis secondary to hip dysplasia, which has not been diagnosed. This is one of the patients who met me in 2007. Already she had symptoms and degeneration. Within two to three years, or look at that, complete arthritis needing a hip replacement. And this is my first osteotomy in Scotland. Even after now, 14 years later, absolutely fine. Still going strong. Still the preserved joint space. Just shows how important it is to try and address these after diagnosing them. We also looked at delayed diagnosis because this was something which has been which was bothering us. This study was done about a decade ago. We from the onset of referral to the presentation in our hip clinic. If it was longer, most of the patients had arthritis. If it was shorter, less than two years, they were still fine to consider periastal or osteotomy or some treatment consideration what we deemed appropriate. So it just goes on to say that trying to detect these patients is important earlier. Who we are, again, we are talking about could be dysplasia like this, or it could be slightly more, or it could be just this. Today, we are obviously not addressing this part at all because this needs some completely different, not a conservative hip surgery. Going back to the presentation, most of the patients present in your clinic with pain in the hip. These are young, fit people, generally, almost like you know, you think nothing is wrong with them. They have may have a pain in the groin or thigh or the knee or shin. Trying or may come with abductor fatigue. At the end of the day, they are tired. They, you know, some ache, achiness in the hip. They're limping sometimes at the end of the day. They may experience clicking or snapping. Instability sometimes they may feel, but not a major symptom. Sometimes, like Callum showed a slide of these, you know, patients doing various activities are finding it difficult. Some hockey players finding it difficult at the end of the game. You know, it's not the same what it used to be. So it is a very subtle presentation we are looking at initially when this present. So you could, when you examine them, again, it's most of the time completely normal. You know, range of motion, you're talking about internal rotation of 40 to 50 degrees, external rotation of, you know, 60 to 70 degrees, impingement test is maybe negative, maybe positive. You think, you know, when you think about internal rotation of 50 degrees, you know, it is, it is a big, big range of motion here. Generally speaking, good range of movement. That's what we are talking about. So when we look at history and examine, then we look at imaging. So when it comes to imaging, generally we tend to do x-rays as a first port of call, which is accessible to all of us in our clinics very easily. These things, which are MRI, CTs, and other things, examination, anesthesia, arthrogram, are done by us on an individual basis, sometimes CTs and MRIs a bit more freely as compared to examination and anesthesia and arthrogram, which are done a little bit more limited basis. I generally do young hip series, which involves pelvis with hips. Already Callum has alluded nicely to Tony's angle or you know, the source angle, basically. It should be less than 10 degrees. It should be horizontal. If it is, it is sloping, that's not normal. Centrage angle, again, we looked at about 25 degrees or more is good. Less than that, again, is dysplasia. I also do AP in weight-bearing x-ray and AP in abduction. AP in abduction, which is on your right side, clearly shows that hip is nicely reducing. It is congruent. That means we can address it by some intervention in the form of conservative hip surgery. I also do cross-table lateral just to see if there's any hernic offset issue. You know, some of these patients do have it. Again, it's in the clinic. It's easily available. And false profile view is another specialist view we do it to try and look at the thickness of the posterior column and looking at the anterior coverage of the femoral head. Also, just by plain x-ray, we can get a lot of information in these cases. It's a specialist view which our radiologists, our radiographers have come to do over the years and just basically tells you where the socket is in relation to the femoral head. And it also tells me anterior centrage angle, how bad it is or how good it is. Of course, we do MRI, contrast scans, or plain scans. If I'm in doubt, especially after 35, 40 years of age, I'm worried, you know, is this, is this patient arthritic? Because 
If the patients have arthritis, you are doubt to failure with any conservative hip procedures. We do CT sometimes to identify the three-dimensional orientation and also to try and see if there is genuine arthritis. Look at this plain x-ray shows good joint space and look at the interior section clearly showing a complete bone on bone with cyst change. So CT does help to try and get this information as well. Of course, Johan has published quite extensively on how to use CT for further planning, et cetera. Sometimes and rarely, I do use examination under anesthesia plus or minus arthrogram. Again, to see this head is not nice, you know, not a spherical head. You've got a socket, which is very small source. So you start debating yourself and hence to get more information, whether conservative hip surgery is going to work or not, we try and get this information. So again, young patient to try and get information. So what I'm trying to get here, we have young people presenting with these problems. Like AJ alluded, it's not a myth. It does exist. So we need to be looking out for these patients. This is a 22-year-old professional football player who came to us a few years ago and had hip arthroscopy somewhere else. Three years later, he has this. So can we avoid this? In the current world, I think we should. We should try and look at it. This is another patient which has been just referred to me there with treatment for greater trochanteric pain syndrome for last many, many months. What we clearly can see is there is a dysplasia. So they can present with these things as well, that is pain at the side of the hip. So we need to be aware, at least a plain x-ray should be done and somebody looks at it and somebody understands it, somebody diagnoses it. That's what I'm trying to get at. This is one of the good articles which Marcus Banks has written, which is published in BMG, it, just an approach to young adult hip. I, I even now go and refresh myself. It's a pretty good article. I think I would strongly recommend it. So we have a lot of hip conditions. We have got AVNs to traumas, to Perthes disease, to tumors. Apart from that, we also have other conditions like gynecological hernias, lymphadenopathies, gonadal tumors, vascular condition. Please be aware that just because an X-ray shows displays your hip impingement or something, doesn't always mean that. So we need to be aware of these other conditions and make sure that we are taking good history and excluding other conditions. So in conclusion, like Vika says, so, you know, take home message, be aware of the condition, be aware. The patient presents to you with symptoms. At least get a plain x-ray if the patient has suffered with symptoms for many months, like say two to three months. You've done conservative management, whatever, at least get a plain x-ray. That should give you an ability to measure certain angles and give a diagnosis of hip dysplasia. Symptomatic patients with plain x-ray, that is good enough. We don't need CTs, MRI scan, that all can be done in specialist center if need be. If they are on the heavier side, please advise them weight management because the journey can start then rather than coming to us, then we having to request them to do that. So it's easy to identify, easy to treat. It's a treatable condition. In this day, we can actually get good outcomes like a Callum uh, clearly said about the outcomes. So that's, that, is, that is the thing I would like to share today. Oh. Yeah, OTH. Oh, AJ, you need yeah, you're on mute. You're mute. <laughs> A classic mistake, isn't it? Sorry. So um, uh, we will be moving on to cases uh, you know, shortly, but uh, I think we've got a couple of minutes for uh, some uh, question and answers. So uh, there has been a question on the chat function uh, that um, about someone who's become dysplastic after pincer removal following arthroscopy. So do you think one can uh, do a periastabular osteotomy or any form of osteotomy for this? What do you think, Callum? What are your thoughts? Um, uh, the short answer is possibly. Um, it, it, uh, I would be concerned, in my experience, of somebody who's had a hip arthroscopy as to what the internal structure of the hip might be and the quality of the cartilage. Um, so I would certainly want to know more about the internal structure of the cartilage before then deciding, because I assume the, the reason why the person is coming is because they've got ongoing symptoms after their hip arthroscopy. And yes, they may be subsequently dysplastic, but I, uh, would be worried about then embarking on a very big operation in somebody who's already had a bad outcome from one operation. So possibly, but I'd have to think about it very carefully. 
Okay. So, um, Sanjeev? Yeah, I think on the similar lines, really. So, somebody to go from Spencer to Dysplastic Hip is quite a big uh, uh, thing for me as well. So, most of the pincers, uh, most of the pincers, I would be quite concerned. I would be essentially thinking on the lines, what Callum alluded to in terms of the condition of the joint to try and make sure that we're not actually seeing degenerative changes here. Can you can you make a difference with osteotomy? Thank you. Thank you. Depends on a case. Well, yeah, Johan, I haven't formally introduced you, but I will. Uh, but uh, do you have any response to this question? You'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think that is very difficult. And uh, ba basically, you have to sort of reevaluate the starting point of the hip, uh, where the dysplasia has been created, reevaluate the articular surface, and then decide whether there's anything reasonable that you can do to then um, readdress the problem. So I think the, the, the management has to be very individualized. So well, quite often, uh, uh, I'll probably turn the question around, quite often what we see is uh, in uh, just plastics, actually they are very antiverted and the posterior part becomes calcified, the labrum becomes calcified and it seems like a, a pincer uh, lesion with a normal centrage angle or increased centrage angle. And uh, uh, while well, anteriorly they are dysplastic. So, what are your thoughts about that? So, I mean, I think um, I think you know if that, if you're developing bone around your acetabulum, that's often a somewhat degenerative process. So, again, I think one has to be very careful about how you would address that. Definitely, there are those cases where you do have either high uh, acetabular version that makes the acetabulum look uh, too shallow in the front, in which case they can be addressed with a sort of retroverting osteotomy, but they're, they're quite unusual. Um, and I think one just needs to be a little bit careful if you've got a process of labral ossification, that's often a sign of a, of a degenerative process going on. But, and then you obviously have to work out whether it's a, it's a, it's a stability problem or whether it's an impingement problem. So that's, that's a fairly key part in terms of deciding then how you're going to address the the actual abnormality and symptoms. Okay. Hey, Jay, uh, can I ask a question at this stage or would you want me to reserve it towards the end? You, you can actually. It's supposed to be interactive, isn't it? So we should right. uh, have some questions. So uh, whilst we are on, on the case of definition and, and deciding uh, which patients to operate on and which patients may do well with conservative management, I want to ask the panel uh, their opinion about borderline dysplasia and FAI together. So the first question would be, what in your practice would you classify as borderline dysplasia? And secondly, if a patient does present with borderline dysplasia and concomitant CAM FAI, how do you decide which one are you going to go for first, addressing the CAM or addressing the dysplasia? Uh, so we, we, can, we can start Yes, Sanjeev, you want to go Sanjeev. first? Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's a great question. Actually, it's a thing which we... Uh, uh, actually face uh, every day in our clinics. I would say a 20 degree uh, centrage angle and less than that, usually I try and think that it is uh, mild hip dysplasia. And then in those patients with uh, a impingement uh, lesion, you know, you've got a cam deformity plus, in those cases, I try and look at the, the, the labrum itself to see if it is hypertrophic or not. You know, that gives me some indication, is it primarily a impinger or a dysplastic? And if I'm convinced that it is not hyper, hypertrophic labrum and it is predominantly this thing, I would err more towards the smaller operation first, which is uh, to address the impingement. And generally, uh, when you're doing the operation, obviously you can again uh, confirm that what your thoughts were. And if it did not show any impingement features, then I'm inclined towards just settling that thing as that and nothing else. Mm -hmm. However, there are occasions where I've done that and then the symptoms were still present with no major degenerative changes. I have, I have done PAO on them to settle their symptoms afterwards. Un unusual, but generally that's my thought process. I base it on the, the centrage angle and the labrum thickness. Yeah. But Callum, Johan, do you have any other comment uh, or shall we go on to this, uh, the first case that Sanjay will present? Um, so, I mean, I think um, an issue, if you have a significant CAM, I mean, I think it, the, the CAM is the thing that's, that's also damaging the joint. So in, in the uh, 
in the situation of a sort of borderline dysplasia, although, you know, we've done some analysis looking at femoral head coverage in so-called borderline dysplasia. And in fact, the degree of coverage actually can be more deficient than you think, even though your center edge angle may be about 25 degrees. But having said that, I think, you know, I do feel that a significant cam does need to be addressed. And if I'm looking at an X-ray and the cam is jumping out at me more than the dysplasia, then I'm happy to address the cam first have the discussion with the patient that they might need a procedure subsequent to that, um, and then deal with the dysplasia if they remain sufficiently symptomatic afterwards. If the dysplasia jumps out and it's combined with a CAM, then I'll often treat that um, during the recovery period after a PAO, for instance. But I do think um, you know, a, CAM, a significant CAM does need to be treated. Good, thank you. So for the sake of time, I think, uh, Sanjeev, do you want to present the first case? Please? Yep, I'll do that. Uh, Can I see this? Yep. Yeah. All uh, right. So first case is a 23-year-old female, desk-based job. Uh, she is com she's complaining of four-year history of right hip pain. She's taking now regular analgesia in the last few months. Sleep is unaffected. She's still attending gym, doing Pilates classes every week, so you can know roughly where she is. And, uh, exam and no other significant past medical history. On clinical examination, she has no tenderness, no limp. Examination movements are quite smooth. Flexion of 100, internal rotation of 40, external rotation of 50 degrees, abduction of 40 degrees. And impingement test is mildly positive in the terminal internal rotation, otherwise unremarkable examination finding. And uh, we obviously uh, do plain x-ray and that's the plain x-ray of the hip. Uh, and do the centrage angle measuring out about 11 degrees or so. So yeah, anybody uh, would like Callum, to- Callum, any concerns? No. It's dysplastic. Yep, uh, clearly very dysplastic and uh, obviously uh, in pain. Yeah, yep. needs, yep. needs a pelvic osteotomy. <laughs> so what if the BMI is uh, 36? Yeah, Pass, send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, so is the 35 a definite cutoff for you? Uh, it depends on where they're, where they're fat. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it depends on the... It's a bit like hip arthroscopy, isn't it? There are... You know, muscular people, and there are fat people, and uh, so it, it, it's a it's the whole approach, isn't it? You know, you you look at them. You know, I think this patient's made of good stuff, and you know, I think they'll do well. Or this is a oh, god, I don't really want to operate on this patient. Or you know, so you use your experience and your judgment as to the variable feast of what their BMI is and where the fat is. Yeah. So are you, but, but I mean, if the BMI is 36 and if there's a young patient in pain and severe dysplasia, um, are we doing them a disservice by not doing the we same? We are, but it's, it's a joint, you know, I'm a great believer that if a patient's going for surgery, that's a joint contract between you and the patient. So they've got to do their bit and then you've got to do your bit. And if that means they've got to lose a bit of weight, then they've got to lose a bit of weight. Johan, what's your take on that? Um, well, I do, you know, I think recovery is, is, is quite difficult when you're heavier. And, um, I think there's a higher risk. There is a higher risk of complications. There's a higher risk of stress fractures. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think you've got to be quite careful, um, and have a, have a, have a discussion with the patient so that they really understand what the risks are. And then ultimately, um, one's looking to see if, you know, the surgery is, you know, fit, uh, actually possible just because of, where where the soft tissues may be, but I think, in general terms, we know that there's a higher complication rate, and you know one has to be very cautious about operating on patients with too high a BMI. I totally agree. Yeah. So Sanjay, what did you do then? Yeah. So this was just in last few weeks ago, actually. So uh, I, we did AP and abduction. Really shows good uh, this thing, and obviously false profile view. CT was done just to see where we are. And uh, just, we did a periastable osteotomy. I think we got a decent correction. Uh, and uh, she's still at six weeks, you know, just, just done a few weeks ago. So she's still, I'll 
I thought it was a good case. <laughs> good. What approach did you use, uh, Sanjeev? I do modified Sabal approach. Basically, it's essentially almost uh, uh, you know modified Smith Peterson approach, which is uh, to try and preserve rectus femoris, uh, both the heads, and then go almost modification of the classic Sobale technique where I just go slightly over the eyelid crust as compared to he doesn't use it at all. So isolate the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh and then go and do the usual cuts, pubic ischium and then eyelid cut and then mobilize it and then put a couple of screws. Basically use the MIS approach. You don't use the extensive approach. That no, I don't. I, I used to use it more than a decade ago. I've stopped it. Yes, thanks. Okay. And do you go for diagnostic injections before uh, operating? I do, I do do it if I'm worried. So if things don't add up, I do do it. If otherwise, I just go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's fine. So you so you take a history, examine the patient, and then you've done the imaging. You know that it is coming from there. That's good enough. Yeah. Okay, good. So the, the next case, I think I'm presenting. So uh, in fact, what I will do is we are running slightly short of time. So I will let Johan uh, present his uh, case first, actually. And um, so um, Johan, a uh, premier surgeon, works in University College uh, London hospitals, is a mentor to not only me, but many surgeons across the country and internationally. He's well-renowned for uh, um, his experience in uh, hip preservation surgery. He's the go-to person for all of us, actually, if you are any, having any problems. Oh, you're very good. ...operating on both sides of the joint. Um, as Callum raised the issues as well, always thinking about the age of the patient, what the condition of the articular cartilage is like. Femoral head sphericity and the potential for impingement is really important. Uh, femoral neck antiversion is something you should also be aware of. The joint congruity, the height is so when we're <clears throat> on some of the conditions such as with perthes, when we may be considering surgery, um, it's the height of the greater trochanter and the potential for impingement, particularly after you've done, for instance, uh, an acetabular rotation. And then obviously the degree of dysplasia will influence whether you, you may need to do something on the femoral side. It is important to have an adequate range of motion. Um, you really can't, can't be doing these operations on a stiff hip. Again, that shows that there may be in incongruency in certain directions. You know, if there's any doubt, an EUA arthrogram, particularly in Perthes type hips, I think it's really helpful to do that. And then of course there should be minimal osteoarthritis. And then some of your decision-making in these cases will be, um, you know, you'll be relying on intraoperative dynamic instability. Um, and I'll just show you, um, show you what that looks like. And on the femoral side, again, I mentioned the sphericity. That's really important. We're looking at the neck length as well, uh, the potential for impingement either before or after the PAO. I don't do many varus or valgus osteotomies, I have to be said. Uh, most of the osteotomies I do would be for version abnormalities. I think maybe in a pediatric practice, one would be doing more varus valgus. In a more sort of adolescent adult practice, I, I very rarely see the need to do a varus valgus osteotomy. So this is an example of a patient who's got significant bilateral dysplasia, <clears throat> a little bit worse on the left and the right. And if you look at the CT, you can see that there's quite a lot more of the femoral head showing on the left side. And the sort of center edge angle is probably around sort of between five and 10 degrees. So what's helpful if you have sort of planning software is, this just illustrates some of the issues. This is a clinical graphics where <clears throat> um, the dysplasia and how you might achieve the correction. But this patient that had at 34 degrees of femoral neck antiversion, and one, one doesn't just operate on an angle of antiversion, there must be a sort of purpose to it, helping reduce the femoral head in the acetabulum by decreasing the antiversion, but also taking into account the range of motion and the rotational profile. So when you do change version, you're obviously creating more movement in one direction, but you'll take be taking movement away from the other direction. So... In this patient, she had very high internal rotation, measuring about 75 degrees, but had very limited external rotation, measuring between 10 and 15 degrees. So that very limited external rotation can also be an issue for people. And Callum mentioned you can have uh, rotational issue issues lower down the limb, and often patients will have a degree of external tibial torsion associated with their high femoral neck antiversion. And it's really important to uh, identify that before you operate on their feet. So just to remember that the whole limb alignment does need to be assessed. 
So here we've identified that potentially we can make the joint look better if we do a derotation. That will also help the patient's uh, rotational profile. You can see that there's significant lack of coverage. And uh, so <clears throat> this is after we've done, I tend to use a plate to do the femoral os. On the other side, um, patient had uh, much less uh, of a rotational problem. Uh, femoral neck antiversion wasn't, you know, very, very abnormal for dysplastics. And so the patient just required a PAO. So the decision-making in this case was really related to the rotational profile and the fact that we felt we could achieve a better correction overall by doing the derotation procedure. So then I'll just go on to another kind of a problem here where we've got more a greater trochanter issue where we've got dysplasia combined with a short femoral neck, a high riding trochanter. So if we correct the dysplastic element, we're bound to create an impingement on the trochanteric side. So this is what uh, this kind of case can look like at the time of surgery. Um, uh, surgical hip dislocation, we do the, the trochanteric slide osteotomy. Uh, and you can see that it's quite unstable, the joints. And when we're rotating it, external rotation, it really is quite unstable. Um, here we've uh, done the retinacular flap. We've recreated the bed for the distalization of the trochanter. And you can see how, how, dis how um, unstable the hip is. So I think that helps you decide whether you're going to need to do either a femoral procedure or an acetabular procedure to, to uh, control the stability of the joint. So here we did uh, the PAO and distalization of the trochanter. So you get this sort of relative neck lengthening, uh, which avoids the impingement. Um, the correction just needs to be judged because you don't want to go too far, otherwise you can create incongruency. So you're often not moving the acetabulum as far as uh, one does in other dysplastic conditions because of you just got to be a little bit wary of congruency in these cases. Um, and then and then she subsequently went on and had the other side done. So this is a, a more classic sort of perthase type hip. Um, the exact etiology in the last one, a little bit more difficult to assess. Um, so you've got this broad, flat femoral head. Um, there's always going to be some incongruency in these kind of cases, but you've got a secondary dysplasia in combination with an impingement type morphology and the high riding trochanter. And I think in these cases, you have got to be, you know, you've got to have sufficient um, uh, shape to the acetabulum where you, by moving it, you aren't going to create a further problem of, of incongruency. Um, but this, again, is the kind of case with sufficient, uh, uh, you know, joint space width and lack of degenerative change in a young enough patient where we do a surgical hip dislocation and a, a relative le uh, lengthening again. So here we're assessing at the time of surgery. Um, we've done the osteotomy and the, 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 the relative lengthening. Um, and then, so that avoids the, the impingement of the trochanter. And then he subsequently went on and had the, the other side done. And with very good remodeling of the, of the pelvis and the pelvic brim. So I, I think the decision-making in these cases is difficult. They've really got to be young enough patients um, you know, once they're sort of late 20s, I think probably the, the horse is bolted. You've already got significant degenerative change, and it's a big hit to, to, to go through the surgery and the recovery. So happy to discuss any, any of those as you wish. Excellent, uh, Johan. Uh, one question, uh, and I don't think it's an uncommon scenario, is uh, sometimes these patients, both these type patients, have unilateral problems, and they are short on uh, the affected side. So what do you do about those? Um, so if that, well, it, again, it's going to depend, you know, what the overall, um, you know, abnormality of the, of the hip is. So, and where, where you think you can achieve better congruency for the perthase. So there'll be some patients that may be better with an uh, adduction osteotomy, where you bring the sort of more medial head up into the articulation. And then if you're doing that kind of procedure, you'll gain some leg length. Um, so I, I wouldn't be chasing leg length per se. I'd be looking more at what I can do for the congruency of the hip. Callum, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, uh, just a question to Johan, really. That, I mean, great cases and great presentation. I mean, you know, I obviously followed on from John O'Hara, who did a lot of these osteotomies in, in Perthes. And, 
you know, my practice is maybe not um, as interventional as he was in doing these kind of osteotomies. And partly that is because arthroplasty has obviously improved so much. Um, and I've always been slightly concerned about compromising the outcome of a a very well done osteo uh, very well done primary total hip replacement and i noticed that with your advancement your trochanteric advancement you're not really changing the internal diameter of the femur in any way so do you feel that you haven't compromised your joint replacement by doing these these fairly large operations on these young people because that that's the concern that i have so I, I think doing sort of major varus valgus osteotomies, I'm much more anxious about with regards to compromising, you know, the potential compromise for, for a hip replacement. So in, in fact, I'm delighted by a distalized trochanter when it comes to a hip replacement, because I think the proximal trochanters can be very awkward to work out what you're going to do about that when it comes to the hip replacement. So, yeah, I think you make a very good point. I think one has to draw the line at some point in patients. That's why, you know, the, Deciding, um, um, you know, the, the the age of the patient is is a critical factor in that, and you have always got to look at the next potential step so that you don't uh, make it difficult for the next procedure. I think that's absolutely like, uh, right. But I must say, I think the distalization of the trochanter is a great step prior to a hip replacement. Vikas, you want to say something? Uh, just just a quick point in terms of uh, diagnosis and uh, actually classifying these uh, again. Focal anterior dysplasia is uh, certainly a, a, a very common occurrence in our clinics. And uh, how good is your centrage angle actually in picking up these? And should we therefore be routinely doing 3D CTs to ensure that we do not miss on these? What, what does the panel feel? So um, personally, uh, I would always get a, a CT scan done. You have to make formal measurements. And um, uh, I think it is actually a serious problem. And you have to look for the anterior wall and how medial it is. So yes, it's extremely critical for me to get a CT scan. In fact, all my patients get a CT scan. Uh, Johan? Well, I think, you know, the, I think um, it's good that you bring that up. And I think these things are easy to miss. And unless you're you know, very, you know, experienced and looking at the anterior wall shadow. There are some other measurements you can do, the anterior wall index, the posterior wall index, all those things you can do. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, and not, not everyone is familiar with those things. And then the, the neck act, axis distance, that's the distance between the anterior and the posterior wall and the axis of the femoral neck. All these things give you a clue that there might be anterior insufficiency. And for me, it, it, it does tend to stand out on the 3D CT, but again, it depends on how familiar you are at looking at these things. But probably if you do the CT and you see the 3D, that would probably be the best thing to highlight it to you if you're not so familiar with the radiographic measurements, which, you know, aren't, you know, it's not, unless you're seeing these things a lot of the time, then you're probably not going to be familiar with those things. Sanjeev Kalam, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I we do CTs on everyone, really, pretty much. So if there's any whiff of dysplasia in a youngish patient, then they'll get, or a virginal abnormality, they'll get a CT with a 3D reconstruction. And like the case I showed with the the normal X-ray in that um, in antiversion, you know, I remember that case really well. Um, Ronan asked me to see her as a friend of a, a daughter, a daughter of a friend and uh, you know it was only when I then got the 3D CT I went oh well clearly that's the problem it kind of leapt out at me but unless you are familiar with it as Johan says and uh, looking for it you you, you missed so much the, the, the amount of delayed diagnosis is incredible in, in these situations it, years and years of patients and multiple interventions often um, and being told they're mad um, before they actually get a diagnosis. And, it, and it's a it's a terrible shame that we miss so much of this. Yeah. Some interesting questions also coming up, actually. So I will uh, proceed with them. Walid has asked, uh, 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 Johan, about Pertis. When is the aspherical femoral head too aspherical for you? And would you actually do a head reduction osteotomy in those? That's um, so I think that's where the EUA arthrogram is very helpful because that is going to you're going to work out whether you've got hinge abduction or what your range of motion is. So in these patients, I pretty much always do an EUA arthrogram. I have to say, I do find that really useful. 
I haven't done any head uh, reduction procedures. I mean, I think, you know, the jury's out on that. And I think unless you're, you've got a big Perthes practice and you're doing a lot of these, your chance of uh, not ending up with femoral head necrosis is pretty slim. So I think um, um, you've got to be rather careful with that. When you look at the CT scans of some of these Perthes hips, uh, the the acetabulum is almost arrow shaped in certain kind of uh, in some of the uh, in some of the cuts, which just shows that the, in certain movements there'll definitely be incongruency, and so it's very hard to fit some of these femoral heads into the socket, whatever you do. So, I think you have to be rather rather careful about that. Um, but for me, I think uh, uh, you must have an adequate range of motion. EUA arthrogram a really helpful way of assessing all of that. Uh, another question, which probably has partly been answered. Obviously, Johan, you mentioned that for Cox, Avera, and Valga, you, it's unusual to do an osteotomy. But uh, Sanjeev, in your experience, do they become dysplastic later on? Well, I've seen quite a few of these, and I, I've got patients with dysplastic, given Cox, Valga, up to 160 degrees, and I've done a Stava osteotomy on them, and they have done well. Do they become dysplastic? I think most of the die is cast by the end of the second decade in a way. It's already there. That's what it is. That's what it is going to be. Yeah. We've lost uh, Sanjeev. There's another yeah. question from Pranay about uh, post birth mm -hmm. sequel and deformities uh, present quite early in adolescence. Should we be addressing these early in teenagers as birth seems to be one of the main causes for teenage THR? I've done some combinations because like what Johanna shown, you know, distillation of the decanter and doing a PU, I have done that. And it does work, but you need to be very selective of your cases. So CT helps me in that, UA and arthrogram helps me in that. And other other thing he mentioned about arrow-shaped femoral, uh, sorry, acetabulum, arrow-shaped femoral head is another thing which is doomed to fail because it won't be congruent even if you do anything. So if a CT section show me arrow-shaped femoral head, that, that's me. I generally do not do any conservative procedures on them. It doesn't work in my hands. Um, there was another question actually from Hiren. Uh, he was asking about, and uh, Callum has tried to answer it, he was asking about borderline dysplastics. Would you routinely close the capsule um, in those patients, Johan? Well, I mean, so I, I don't do big capsulotomies with my hip arthroscopy. So, you know, I'm you know, I've always been very careful about that. So, I mean, I think if you are doing a standard large interportal cap capsulotomy, then I, you have to be very, very, very careful if you're doing that in a borderline dysplastic. Um, you definitely do. And so if, that, if that's what your standard is, then I think probably one needs to be thinking, one might need to think about having to close it. Sanjeev? Yeah, same here. Any dysplastic hip, I'm very careful not to do big capsulotomies uh, when I'm doing capsulotomy and capsulectomy is very limited. Mm. And uh, there's another very interesting question, actually, uh, perhaps uh, not relevant to dysplasia, but uh, uh, is ACI available in the hip yet? And um, if you would like to correct the mechanics first, then ACI focal cartilage, could this be done as one procedure? Who wants to take that on? I think that's a topic for another webinar, AJ. It is. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll do that. We'll cover that in another section. We've got uh, one on cartilage injuries. So that's right. I think time is running out. So, Absolutely, yeah. so, the, yes, uh, the, so there was ahead. an interesting case of retroversion that uh, I wanted to present, but for the sake of time, I would uh, probably leave that. Callum has already covered it, actually. So uh, the, the key message from this webinar would be that uh, if you are seeing a young patient who is in pain and who has, in be, has been in pain for some time. Take it seriously, examine the patient, take a good history. You will get cues from the history and examination itself as to what is going on. Look at the x-rays carefully, formally measure your center edge angle and establish index. Look at the anterior and the posterior wall. And a plain x-ray will give you lots of information. And that is probably enough, but CT scan would just corroborate this. I think diagnostic hip injection, probably not mentioned formally, but it is important. And yes, there is a solution which can be uh, done for dysplastic patients, for surgery can be done for dysplastic patients reasonably safely, obviously needs to be done by someone who's experienced, has done lots of them. That makes it easier for the patient and of course uh, the, the surgeon.
So those would be my final words. So I would like to thank all the faculty for participating. It's brilliant to have you all here. And I'm sure all of you would have found it uh, interesting too. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking your evening out um, um, for this webinar. Vikas, some final words? A big thank you to all of you for uh, giving up your time this evening. And a big thank you to all of you for hanging around actually till the end of the webinar. For those of you who've missed it, it's available on our educational platform, Panopto. Have a lovely evening. And from all of us here, a big thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.